Welcome back to Unveiling the Covenant, where we explore the mysteries of sacred scripture and the covenant love of God the Father from the heart of the church. My name is Marcus Peter, your regular host. If you've been following this program, you will notice that we have gone through all of the Old Testament covenants and we spent an entire month after that focusing on the works of the prophets. In that month, we looked at how all the prophets and everything that they did pointed to the person of Jesus Christ, anticipating not only his saving messiahship, but also the covenant that he would establish, ratify, and fulfill in his person on behalf of all mankind for the sake of God. Christ alone becomes the true bridge between God and man. So let's take a recap of some of the models and signs of the covenants that we have established so far. We saw, first and foremost, the covenant with Adam in the earliest parts of Genesis. And we saw that God made Adam a husband in the covenant model of a marriage, having the Sabbath as the sign of that covenant. We moved on then later into Genesis, where we saw Noah receive a covenant established by God, and Noah is now father over a household. He is the father of that household wherein it's his wife and his children and him and, the, and his son's brides. That makes a total of about eight people. And the sign of that covenant is the rainbow. And then after that, we have Abraham. Abraham becomes a tribal chief. He's a chieftain. So you see that there's an expansion in the family model. He is the head of a tribe and circumcision becomes the sign of that covenant. What you're also seeing is that the signs of the covenant become more and more specific and even tangible. We get the covenant with Moses, where Moses sits as judge over the nation of Israel as the family form, and the Passover, the liturgy of the Passover, becomes the sign of that covenant. And then from there, we get King David. David is king. He is king over the kingdom of Israel, which is the family of God. It has grown into a kingdom now. And the throne of David becomes the sign of that covenant, which now brings us to the person of Jesus Christ. And while I'll give, the, give this to you in an overview, what we're going to spend the next month doing is evaluating all of these attributes, talking about how Christ fulfills all of the earlier covenants, but even more than that, how Christ ultimately becomes the sole true mediator of all covenant to come. In the eternal Jerusalem, there will be no new covenant. There will be an eschatological fulfillment of the covenant we have in the person of Jesus Christ. And Christ is not just king and priest and husband and father and tribal chief. In fact, he is all of the above and he is royal high priest. As the book of Hebrews tells us, he is the great royal high priest king. The family form has gone even beyond a national kingdom. It is now a universal kingdom, a people of God, an arm Yahweh, a people of God, a family that is dedicated to God. And we will talk about the term dedicated and what that means. And this family, universal as it is, is called the universal church, the Catholic church. And the Eucharist, this tangible reality, becomes the sign of this covenant forevermore. So let's move on from there then. How did Christ fulfill what the law and the prophets foretold? As we've been talking about, the Old Testament simply stood as a veil and the name of this program is Unveiling the Covenants because there is no speaking about the Old Testament covenants if we don't unveil them in the person of Christ. Christ is not only the light that unveils the covenants, he is the priest, the great high priest who unveils the covenants and rips the temple curtain so that you and I can behold the covenants for what they truly are. It is in the person of Christ, Eusebius tells us, that all of the covenants become truly unveiled and and laid bare before our very eyes. So when scripture tells us that Christ lifts the veil, it is in his person that all of this comes to fruition, fulfillment, and its truest meaning and culmination. That's why the promises, the attributes, the conditions, the curses, and all of the stipulations of all of the old covenants find utmost and complete perfect fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And we need to make this clear. When I was an atheist, 
nothing baffled me more than the claims made by the founders of every major religion. And so I investigated all of them. And in my process of investigation, I came to realize that only Jesus Christ said what he said, meant what he meant, and fulfilled what he fulfilled without error. The odds of someone else doing that is a mathematical impossibility. And I'm not making this up. This is an historical fact. So if that is the case, what I want to put to us is that Jesus Christ is not just any other moral teacher. He is not just man whom we have divinized. He is truly God who came and assumed human nature for the sake of our salvation and to establish this wondrous covenant with you and with me. And this is precisely why Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He says this himself in Matthew 5, 17. It's so easy for us to say, okay, you know, that the Old Testament doesn't apply to us anymore. We've got Jesus. Let's forget the Old Testament. God was so mean in the Old Testament. That's a false reading of scripture. If ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, then ignorance of the Old Testament is ignorance of a big portion of understanding who Christ is. One cannot reject the Old Testament any more than one can reject the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It brings, a, it brings about a true corruption in one's own life. So when we take a look at the Law and the Prophets, we need to read all of the Old Testament with a Christological lens, which is what De Verbum told us, which is what Verbum Domini told us, which is what Providentissimus Deus told us. All of this finds us at the foot of the New Testament. We now turn the page of sacred scripture, closing the Old Testament. And as we move into the New, we need to take a look at those words, testamentum themselves. Have you ever wondered why the Bible is split into the Old and New Testament? Have you ever asked yourself what testament means? The Latin word testamentum is the Latin translation of the Greek diatheke, which simply means covenant. If you've been following this program, you'll realize that the Hebrew berit, the, Lat the Greek diatheke, and the Latin testamentum all translate into the exact same thing, covenant. God covenants himself with us. So if we're looking at all of scripture, what are we to understand? That the five Old Testament covenants form the heart of one covenant. The new covenant in Christ forms the heart of the one covenant. All of scripture is united by the one covenant that has seen an initialization and expansion and continued growth and continued elevation and continued blessing to now with a universal reality. This, my friends, is the hope you and I have. So now we turn the page because what Jesus does for his disciples when he unveiled the meaning of the Old Testament, he does for us now when we go through sacred scripture in the liturgy. So I want to give, us, give this to us in a nutshell. Jesus perfectly fulfills the entirety of the Old Testament. He fulfills the covenant with Adam in a nutshell because he alone restores our covenant bond with God that Adam's original sin severed. Christ alone brought about the restoration of the bond that man had with God that prior to this man could not bridge by himself. I remember as a Protestant, and I've mentioned this in previous episodes, Christ paid a debt he didn't owe because you and I owed a debt we couldn't pay. And I need to stress this very clearly. The debt of sin is an affront against the eternal God. We are eternal beings. We have a beginning, we won't have an end. In other words, we owed a debt that was infinitely beyond what you and I could pay. And if that is the case, then only God, the infinite God, could pay that debt. But if we need him to pay that debt, we need to take it a step further. He needs to pay it on behalf of us, and that's why God became man. But we also need to take it a further step. If he's going to pay that debt for us, he cannot have the debt himself. And that's why God became man and was completely sinless. My brothers and sisters, Christ is the new Adam. So how is Christ the new Noah then? Because just as the waters of the flood became a sign of damnation and destruction for all sin, it became a sign of salvation for Noah and his family. Within the ark, 
which becomes a type of the church. The waters of baptism become the means and modus of us entering into the new and eternal covenant with Jesus Christ. When I was a Protestant, we used to quote John 3.16 a lot. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And in John chapter 3, we also go on to see that a man must be reborn by water and the Spirit. And we never talked about what that meant. We talked about being reborn from above. Oh, receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior is what it means to be reborn. Or professing faith in Jesus Christ is what it means to be born again. I put it to you that Jesus was very explicit that being born again meant being born of water and the Spirit. The Greek is very specific. And there's only one sacramental, liturgical means through which a person can go from one life and to receive water and the Spirit and enter into a new life in Christ. You and I already know what it is. It's baptism. So Christ becomes a new Noah because in the new ark, His ark, the church, He has established the new waters of baptism. This is rebirth by water and the Spirit. This is how we enter into the covenant that He has established for us and for our salvation. How is Christ the new Abraham? Because just as God promised to bless all mankind and their descendants through Abraham, Christ fulfills the ultimate reality of that blessing because through Christ, all the peoples of the world are blessed. And I want to make this very, very clear. There is no other name by which we are saved except through the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I, as Christians, have an obligation to live that. We have an obligation to profess that. We have an obligation to stand firm on that fact and to proclaim it with boldness. There is no other name by which mankind is saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. That means if there is any hope for people who are not Christian to be saved, it is simply because of the saving work of Jesus Christ to begin with. If Jesus Christ did not do what he did, there would be no hope of salvation for anyone. But because Jesus Christ did what he did, all mankind is now blessed. We have the right and the privilege, we have the invitation from God himself to receive of the saving work. And that's how Christ becomes the new Abraham. All mankind is blessed through him. He is the name through which we are all saved. Christ becomes the new Moses because just as Moses gave the law of righteousness in the Old Testament, Christ gives us the new law, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. He gives us the great commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he gives us this grand sermon that we find in the Gospel of Matthew, towards the earlier part of the Gospel of Matthew, called the Sermon on the Mount, within which is contained the Beatitudes, within which is contained the Lord's Prayer, within which is contained all of the stipulations of the new law. If someone slaps you on your left cheek, give them your right cheek. If someone asks you to go one mile, go two miles with them. No longer are we bound by legalistic civil law. We are bound by the law of charity itself, by the law of service and sacrifice itself. Christ is the new Moses. And finally, Christ is the new David. Because just as David was king over Israel, Christ sits upon the throne of David as king over all the world. But it's a little more than that. Just as David had Bathsheba as his queen mother, Christ has Mary as his queen mother. Just as David had a temple that became the locus of worship, not just for Israel, but for the entire world, Jesus has established himself as the true temple. He has established the Catholic Church and the tabernacle of the Catholic Church, his Eucharistic sacrifice, as the locus of worship for the entire world. So Christ's kingship is a priestly, royal kingship. This is how Christ fulfills every one of the covenants in a loose term. So let's talk about the concept of belonging to Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the concept of church. You and I use that word very frequently, but we need to stop and ask ourselves what on earth that means. From the beginning, God had a plan to save us. I want us to revisit Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 16, we have, as you remember in one of the older episodes, what's known as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. And in that first gospel, we see that God promises a Savior who would 
come to save mankind from Satan, God talks to Satan as he does this, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And I, I did some exegesis on this in the past, but I also want to help us with a very, very bad mnemonic device. I find this to be a hilarious mnemonic device. Years ago, I was teaching scripture in California, and a colleague of mine in one of her classes taught about the Proto-Evangelium. And because these were people who had never heard the gospel before, and they were trying very hard to remember the term, they honestly, sincerely confused it with the words proto evangelifish I don't know if that helps you. I find it ludicrous. But if it helps you, it helps you. Proto means first evangelium, or evangeli evangelium means gospel. God says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the seed of the woman. This is the first and only time in all of Scripture where we see it is the seed of the woman and not the seed of the man. In Scripture, the heritage is passed down from father to son. The priesthood is passed down from father to son. The kingship is passed down from father to son. The head over the tribe, the, the, authority, uh, the authority over a group of people is passed down from father to son. And yet, God is very specific. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and between the woman, between your seed and between her seed. What this tells us, the early church fathers, take a look at this text and pause it, is that there is an instance where we can believe in a kind of virgin birth because Christ will not be born of the seed of man, which is objectively true. And from the moment of his conception, Christ had enmity on earth with Satan. But even before that, as the Son of God, he always had enmity with Satan from the time of Satan's rebellion against the Trinity. Now, I want to go a step further than that by positing this. Because God handpicked Mary to be his handmaiden and mother of the Savior, what I want to posit then is that Satan had enmity with Mary herself. And that's why he must have sought to end her life as well as Jesus' life. And that's why the flight to Egypt was for Mary's sake as well as for Jesus' sake. And that's why God makes it very clear. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Satan hates Mary as much as he hates Jesus because Mary was such a subservient, obedient, receptive woman to the will of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, in ancient Israel, the way to kill a snake was by crushing its head. One of the main reasons is because if one were to sever the head very quickly, that head could still thrash around and present a danger to people. So to, up till the point of the cessation of Israel as a purely agricultural nation, it was commonplace to crush the head of the serpent in order to kill it, to prevent it from causing venomous death to people but you will strike his heel. Now, remember, this prophecy was made ages before the concept of anti-venom. The person whose heel was bit by a venomous serpent surely saw death. So what was God saying? I put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. I'm jumping ahead here, but all of this points to the fact that in destroying Satan, the Savior, born of the Virgin, would also die. Something bad would happen to him and Satan would bring about his death, which is exactly what happened in the person of Jesus Christ. This is precisely why, based on the Proto-Evangelium alone, no one has fulfilled covenant theology and salvation history like the person of Jesus Christ. This is why we can call ourselves church. So let's take a look at the word church. The word church the Latin, and, and the Latin ecclesia, let's focus on the Latin ecclesia. The Latin ecclesia is taken from the Greek ekkaleion, three words combined together. Called out, called out of, ekkaleion, called out of. The people of the church are called out, they are set apart. If you and I belong to the ecclesia, the, the, the member of the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ that has been called out, we are not called to be members of the world. We live in this world, but we are called to live a higher calling. There is a moral impetus, a divine impetus, a covenantal impetus that we are called to live. Covenantal life with Christ stipulates ways in which we are to live every facet of our life. 
This is why you and I belong to a church that has the necessity of not being like the world. And this is beautiful because you and I have the assurance that in as much as the church is called out of the world, her teachings will never change. It doesn't matter how many people lobby and fight and protest and try to redefine truth and moral realities. It doesn't matter how many people come before the Pope or bishops. It doesn't matter how many bishops and how many synods say it is time to change the church's moral stance. None of that holds any bearing for one reason. The church has been set apart and called out to be the body of Jesus Christ. And because Christ is unchanging, truth is unchanging. And if truth is unchanging, the church is unchanging. Man will come and go, but the deposit of faith handed down before Christ, through Christ, to his apostles, to us, will remain completely unscathed. And this is our assurance. But the second word that we have for the, for the word church comes from the Greek word kuriake. Kuriake, where the German word kirche comes, and that German word eventually becomes the English word church. Kuriake, for those of you who know kurie, kirie, kirie eleison, kuriake means a people of the Lord, or people who belong to the Lord, that which is the Lord's or of the Lord. We are kuriake. We are to the Lord, of the Lord. We are for the Lord. We have stamped upon our souls by means of our baptismal reception of the covenant, by means of our confirmational reception of an elevation in the covenant, and for those of us in holy orders, by means of an elevation into sacramental holy orders, stamped upon our souls the sign and symbols of the covenant. That indelible mark, even if we were to reject Christ, will never wash away. And that's why as we read in Dante's Inferno, it's very clear that the demons in hell see the souls of Catholics. They see the souls of the baptized. They see this mark upon their souls. And the torture for them is disproportionately more than those who are not kuriake. Covenantal living brings with it a deathly onus. Honestly, in the Old Testament, the message was live in accordance with the covenant or face physical death. But now as we see elevated in the covenant with Jesus Christ, live in accordance with the covenant or face spiritual death, eternal death. And that, my friends, is why you and I have an obligation to live out the fullness of this covenant as best we can. So if I were to read from Catechism 751, what I want to share with you about us as church is that as we belong to the covenant of Christ, the word church designates the assemblies of the people, usually for the purpose of religious and liturgical worship. This is why our assembly as the new Israel becomes the community of Christian believers. In the church, God calls us together, and He calls us from all the ends of the earth. The equivalent term of the Greek Kiriake, Kiriche in German, means we belong to the Lord, and we are what belongs to the Lord. This is why it is proper to say that from the first covenant, man has belonged to the Old Testament church. I want us to process this. Adam, all the way to every man that lives right now within the faithfulness of the Catholic Church, belongs to the church of God. This is why we are connected to a reality of church that's infinitely transcended because it belongs to God Himself. We, the church on earth, the pilgrim church, are connected to the church in purgatory, the church suffering, who are also connected to the church victorious, the church triumphant. As we live this connection, we see it most tangibly fulfilled in our continued renewal of our covenantal sign, which as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, is the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the liturgy of the Mass of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. This is why, as my father-in-law very often comments, and I pray for such a grace of Eucharistic fervor, the Eucharist becomes the linchpin of human existence. Because if we get the Eucharist right, 
all other things must be subservient to the fact that this sign of the covenant is what becomes the vehicle of salvation for all mankind. Christ didn't establish a Eucharist as simply a memorial symbolic meal. He has established it as a sacramental means of our salvation. This is why during the reign of John Paul II, it was very properly said, the Eucharist is the source and summit of all Christian life. Our lives flow forth from this covenantal sign of the Eucharist so that it can come back to this covenantal sign of the Eucharist. So I want to recap once again. Christ, His role is our royal high priest king. And as royal high priest king, He fulfills every one of the covenants that came before Him. And He is head of the new covenant family, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the universal Am Yahweh, family of God. And He has established at the core of this, the sign of the Eucharist, the sacramental means of His presence on earth, for the sake of the salvation of the souls of all who receive Him, and ostensibly for all mankind. I want to thank you for joining us on today's episode of Unveiling the Covenants. Continue to stay with us. We're going to keep diving into the mystery of the covenants and how it permeates every aspect of our Christian life. Until next time, God bless you and keep you always. I'm Marcus Peake.